the upper universe has seen an addition of not just one but two exciting chips and guess what they have put all the other chips into shape hi my name is harshanki and you're listening to the i geeks blog show an apple exclusive podcast where we talk about teeny tiny every possible information about the apple ecosystem At this event, a lot of exciting products were announced. Well, because of the increasing rumors and leaks and whatnot, we were already aware about uh, the M1 chips and the new MacBook Pros coming into the market. But oh boy, did the performance surprise us or what? I mean, as long as I was, uh, you know, listening to all the leaks and rumors and being a loyal M1 user for a good six months now. I was kind of looking forward to a better upgrade, a better performance upgrade, and everyone saw it coming. The fact that M1 chip in itself was so freaking incredible that the successors were going to be way better and much, much, much more improved. Forget about the competitions coming anywhere close to them, and they have proved this absolutely right. I mean, when you look at M1 Pro or M1 Max. it has just blown our minds but i'm going to leave the technical part for the later part of the episode the first thing and the most important thing that is to be discussed is who and why should people buy these books because okay the performance is really nice and they're fast and everything is working but these babies do come with a price tag and these babies are not cheap at all so who and why should they even buy these books is a major concern and discussion of today's episode not just that with the addition of new m1 chips do you guys think this is the end of the intel era or amd for that matter i mean okay amd would be an exaggeration but do you think this is the end of the intel era and i mean is intel going to be the next nokia or next blackberry for that matter i have a lot of lot of questions and we're going to discuss all of them but Please do connect with us on our social media channels. We are available on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter as I Geeks Blog. And do not forget to send your feedbacks to us. I'm available on Instagram and Clubhouse as Harshanki. Okay, okay. Coming back to the discussion, I can just visualize the 14-inch and the 16-inch MacBook Pros that have come to the market and the performances these chips bring in for us. I mean, when you even talk about M1 that was launched last year and Apple's call it monopoly call it a smart business move or anything for that matter they want to make apple ecosystem intel free in the coming years and they have started moving in that direction well apple has always wanted to create an apple universe right and that's what i've been calling it apple universe for that matter like the codependency of all the products have increased enormously But when you talk about the M1 chip and its performance, it was mind blowing even back then. So then, what makes M1 Max and M1 Pro so freaking different? To start with, M1 chip uh, Mac Air and Pro came with eight core CPU, but this number has changed in its successor. So the now now the MacBooks that you see in the market. uh the M1 Pro and the M1 Max powered MacBooks will have 10 core CPU similar number right so what what do you think makes it different well it's the GPU that has freaking blown my mind and the cores that has come in the GPU because they have literally doubled doubled i'm not kidding my friends they have doubled in the coming models as you must have read or if you've seen the event you would have noticed that M1 Pro comes with 16 freaking core GPU, whereas M1 Max comes with a gigantic 32 core GPU, and that is sick. Imagine, you know how Apple used to be um, like a business or a corporate class company, and those were the people that they were targeting. with the recent additions in the apple product this has freaking diversified so now they're not just 
you know, targeting the corporate people or it's not just a personal computer anymore or used for business meetings and taking notes or to look fancy in the episodes for that matter. Now, Apple is focusing on photographers, Apple is focusing on cinematographers, Apple is focusing on people who are into, say, games like playing big, big games that require huge processors, huge GPUs and programmers that require an incredible system that doesn't hang no matter what you do. And these babies are proving exactly that. I'm not the one who is claiming that. A lot of tests and performances have been done because it's been, what, a week at least to the launch? There are a lot of comparisons and I'm not going to bore you with that to be really honest. But the results were that the performances have come to be five times faster when it compares to Intel or AMD. And that is almost impossible to achieve. Five times faster performance. Just let that sink in. Just let that sink in. I mean, isn't that gorgeous? And hey, you know what? Not just that. These are the devices that can be used by professionals and not just people who are learning how to code or people who are learning how to do the basic editing work and things like that. These are the devices that can be used by high-end programmers, by high-end coders, by, say, super pro-level people in their respective fields because that is the result that these babies are given up, right? And... I mean, what wouldn't I give to have that MacBook in my hand, be it the M1 Max or the M1 Pro? And yeah, I mean, what can I say? I, I cannot process how fast are these devices going to be, how incredibly fast these chips are. But as discussed, these chips come with a heavy, heavy price tag. And well, the performance is worth it, but it all narrows down to do you want that performance? Do you want a gadget that is so freaking fast and is just the best out there? And that brings me to a very interesting topic. Now, I'm, I know I'm getting a little distracted, but it's very important to discuss because, you know, when you look at it from a non-technical point of view, when you look at it from a strategic point of view, you'd see Apple is ending its 15 years of partnership. 15 years of partnership with Intel and gradually, very slyly, removing Intel chips from every. And you know, how is it going to impact Intel? They wouldn't be able to operate at its full capacity because one of its major contributors and buyers of chips has stopped buying from them. This is, this is a huge loss that Intel has to incur because Imagine like of all the client revenue that you're getting, any any small scale business, any influencer, any any freelancer for that matter can relate to this discussion right here. That if 50 to 60% of your revenue is coming from one client, you'd call it as a high ticket client and there is no way you want to lose that client. Now, what if that client has gets an in-house team and stops using your services? That's a client genius. It's a client monopoly. But on the other hand, it is putting you out of business. And that is going to come with a heavy cost to you. So Intel has a lot of work to do here because if they want to keep their factories up and going, then they have to have a steady source of income, an increasing source of revenue that can match to the revenue that they were generating from the Apple universe. And that, my friends, is a huge task to do. Not just that. Like, think about it, okay? Even if they're putting Intel out of business, they'll like stop buying products from Intel. The performance that the M1 chip is giving is so freaking incredible that it's going to take Intel years and years to come up with a better processor than this. And by the time they come up with it, Apple is already, you know, moving forward with its ever-expanding chips and the gorgeous performances that they have been giving. Again, putting Intel into an endless loop. Well, this has been an ongoing debate on Twitter for a very, very long time that who is going to emerge as a winner or what is going to happen to Intel? What is the future of Intel? Intel, on the other hand, thinks otherwise. 
I mean, to ask me, if you ask me whether Intel is dead or not, or how is the Apple's monopoly going to affect Intel? I low-key want Intel to come up with a better solution, but if you list out the pros and cons right now, they're currently neutralized and they cancel each other out. So they are, they're just nullifying. Let me explain. Okay, we've all agreed to the fact that Apple has held its monopoly for such a long time. And that's why once you're an Apple user, you there's no going back. On the other hand, if you look at it now, there is a huge market that is still dependent on Intel processors and AMD processors powered laptops, be it for your personal needs or be it for your gaming needs or educational purposes or business purposes. There's a huge, huge market out there. And a lot out of all the sales that you look at, the total number of laptops or the total number of, say, uh, PCs that were sold last year, 70% of the revenue or 70% of the gadgets sold belong to the other side. This includes all the laptops, the Windows-powered laptops, the Linux, Ubuntu-powered laptops and things like that. Now, this is where the winning ticket for Intel lies because Intel AMD can do a lot of things hither and thither and continue ruling that thing. A, they are cost efficient. So when they are cost efficient, a lot of people are going to be buying that instead of going for a high, a premium laptop which is giving you a better performance. B, people are not ready to switch that easy. Now, I don't have to give you examples. I mean, there are trillions and trillions of tweets out there, memes out there on Instagram with the ongoing uh, Android versus iPhone debate or the Apple versus Windows debate, the Mac versus Windows debate and so on. So it's the, you know, the shifting rate from this side to that side is going to take a hell lot of time and people hardly shift. Once you're comfortable to something, the chances of you moving to the other ecosystem are very less negligible, almost zero, which means the user retention rate on this side is also a pro. And Intel, if can focus on that, it's not going to die that early. It's not going to be the next Nokia or the next BlackBerry. Coming to the third point, there is a wide, wide array of people out there who probably don't care about the number of transistors that I use. I mean, if I give you, uh, say, 32 billion transistors or 57 billion transistors, you'd be surprised because there's like billions involved. But how many of you do you, how many of you, you know, even know why are those transistors added to the chip or what is the impact it is giving you? What is the performance increase that those transistors are giving you? So, say a lack of awareness is also something that is going to add a pro to the Intel side because it is going to be beneficial to them and it is going to help them keep on retaining more users, as much users as possible. But these are the things, you know, it's high time that Intel or AMD developers consider and come up with a good alternative. Sadly, I do not see that happening. Unpopular opinion, okay? But what happens is that, you remember the Intel versus Mac ads that were very popular in the mid-2000s and uh, say last year also there were a bunch of them that came out. Intel came out with these ads and they just backlashed. If you don't remember, there is an episode for that. So you can just scroll and look for that episode. It's titled Intel versus Mac. But yeah, so Intel doesn't really understand that there are two areas that they can diversify. A first area is something they have to be very patient upon because they have to come up with a product that not only sustains the market, but freaking beats the M1 chips that are coming up. Because every year or two, they're going to come up with chips that are bigger and better and faster than this. So this is one segment. This is one area of development and growth that they have to focus on. The second area of development and growth that they have to focus in is the huge audience that they have already. And how to contain them, how to keep them satisfied and how to keep them going. Now, why I gave you an example of Intel versus Apple, uh, Intel versus Mac ads that came out last year was because Intel messed that. 
Intel messed that up big time because of all the five ads that came out. Not a single ad was directed to the Intel chips. All the ads were directed to the laptops or the models that are being used. And this is just mistreating or misunderstanding the lack of awareness that the society has. Agreed that a lot of people may not be informed or educated about what does a chip do to your laptop and how does it work. But that doesn't mean you can just come out with a campaign like this and just mess this all up. You know? It was so bad that even a non-technical, forget about a partially tech person, a non-technical person would understand that these advertisements are not directed to the performance of Intel chips. On the other hand, these were just directed to mock the things that Apple doesn't have, which is a very cheap way to promote your products. And it's very, you know, they seemed like a compilation of all the um, Mac versus Intel tweets or the Android versus iPhone tweets that we see. Like, or we scroll through. And that is something we need to work upon. So coming back to the first part, the first, first thing that they need to work upon to beat the competition is have a team developing a product, developing the chip that is better, faster, for that matter, matching this and somehow manage to maintain the price module that they have because currently that is the USB. The second thing is to focus on the existing customer base that they have and try to keep these people happy, satisfied and contented to a point that these people start trusting Intel blindly or start trusting AMD blindly and just not switch to a smoother, faster or a better ecosystem. Yeah, see, I'm going to say that because I'm a little biased to Apple. I've been using their products and I was a person who has made the switch. But yeah, I mean, I'm just going to appreciate Apple a little more, but this is a very unbiased opinion that I'm giving. And genuinely, this is something they should be focusing upon. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing on it so much is because Intel doesn't really do a good job. At all. If you guys remember all the, I'm, Okay, so I'm not sure if all the Gen Zs would remember, but see, I'm a Gen Z and I remember, so I'm hoping all the Gen Zs would know and remember. But all the millennials out there, you would remember those advertisements that said Intel inside, or those tiny little stickers on your first laptops that mentioned Intel inside. Intel was freaking unbeatable. No competition. Every, every device out there had Intel. Every freaking device out there had Intel. Apple, for that matter, who has a monopoly of converting everything and developing their own products, also had Intel partnership going on for 15 years. But Intel messes that up. They had gotten to a stagnant still from a waterfall. They had just settled down into this beautiful lake and they were nowhere going forward. No in Nothing that satisfactory when you talk about the processes, the performance, the speed, nothing that satisfactory was coming upon. And even talking about the manufacturing point of view, there were a lot of problems that were noticed. And, you know, a few more problems here and there has gotten Intel to a very uncompromising position. And because of that, they've had issues keeping up the biggest clients. To think of it, Agreed, monopoly is one of the reasons and Apple just wants to start developing everything on their own. But if they're getting something from the outside and if they're happy with the performance and results, they wouldn't really make the switch. For that matter, go to the excruciating lens to come up with one of the best chips out there with years and years of research, manpower and the money put behind. I don't need to remind you guys the amount of things that Apple keeps buying from Samsung when it comes to iPhone and the raw materials, right? So just think about it rationally. The level of unsatisfaction had reached to a point Apple had to start coming up with their own freaking chips. Now, this is something that Intel needs to work upon in order to sustain in the market. To think of it, AMD is also a very recent entry in the market. It wasn't 
or hasn't always been there. And considering how gorgeous is the performance for AMD chips in the gaming sector, the gamers have just blindly started using them. And you know, does it become like a gamer chip for that matter? I may be exaggerating a little here, but the bottom line remains the same that AMD has also taken a part of share of the Intel market because better performance and cheaper models. Intel, when would focus on these things, probably wouldn't die that easy. But as far as sustenance is continued, it may not be able to operate at the full capacity. However, it is still going to be having the existing user base that they have, not because they don't want to shift, but because this just still stands in the more affordable category. So it's going to continue being that for the DD, DD, DD. Coming towards the end of the episode. This has been a very open discussion. Okay, So when I talk to you guys on the episode, what I feel is that I'm just letting my thoughts out here. And I'd want to know what's the feedback. And I'd want to you know, just discuss these things. And so I've left a lot of technical things out there, a lot of uh, business point of view, a lot of marketing things, and all the monopolies. I've left all the technicalities out there and oversimplified the discussion because at the end of the day, what matters is should you buy it or not? And that brings me to the last segment of the episode. Should you get yourself an M1 Pro or an M1 Max powered MacBook? I may or may not get myself a new Mac. Not because I have the need, that is a separate issue. Because as creators, our duty is to test the gadgets and, you know, analyze them so that we can come up with better reviews for you guys. But for a personal use, I probably wouldn't get it because I really don't want to spend, say, $2,000 or $2,500 and get myself a laptop that is just not needed to. Because I don't really have some high-end programming needs that I need this or, say, rendering a 4K video that I need such a high processor for. So I may not do that, but for testing purposes, I will. So again, it depends on your profession. If your profession asks for it, Go for it, invest in the gadget and just forget about the rest because it's the best performance you can ever get and it is extremely satisfactory. Great to use for that matter. For the others, there's nothing wrong with using Intel or AMD power chips. I mean, again, you'd find a number of comparison videos out there, the number of podcasts out there that's going to list what are the pros and cons. So it all narrows down to what you need and what you don't need and how can you just take the most out of it. And I know you guys are very smart people. So you guys are going to make the choice that suits you the best, that suits your pocket the best. And if it is an investment, go for it. If it is just something because you have to upgrade yourself to the latest and the best, maybe take a step back and think about it twice. That's all for today. I hope you like the content. If you do, please connect with us on our social media channels. We're available on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter as iGeeksBlog. If you want to connect with me or have a personal discussion, just hit me up on Instagram. I'm available as Yashanki with an extra I. And I'll come back next week with another exciting topic. The festive season is here. So that requires us to do a little bit of shopping and maybe come up with reviews for those products that we've bought. Stay tuned, stay connected. This is Harshanki signing off. I'll see you next week. Till then, take care.